Our reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 to 12. If you don't have a Bible, please raise your hand. And if you get one of those Bibles, you'll find the passage on page 609. This morning we read of an awesome holy God and the contrast of sinners who seek him. Isaiah 64, the whole chapter, from verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for you, for him. You come to help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet, Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. O oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. Your sacred cities have become a wasteland. Even Zion is a wasteland. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and glorious temple where our ancestors praised you has been burned with fire and all that we treasured lies in ruins. After all this, Lord, will you hold yourself back? Will you keep silent and punish us beyond measure? This is God's word. Hey, how are we? Good to see you all. If we haven't met, my name's James, one of the pastors here at Norwest. Um, as we begin, I uh, want to draw to your attention that um, community groups are finishing up soon or have already finished up for you, and, and January is kind of a quieter period, and sometimes uh, some of our people are looking uh, to be encouraged and to continue to be in God's Word over the summer break. And so uh, every year for the last five or six years, we've run uh, a thing in January, uh, giving that opportunity, run by a guy called Dennis Marnie. Uh, from our 4.30 congregation, uh, and he runs a series of sessions on different topics, and just that window when you've got a bit more spare time in January. Uh, and so this year he's going to be looking, or January this time, he's going to be looking at God's Word in my life. Um, and a number of our people have done this over the years and have found it really helpful. So I want to commend that to you. The details of when it's on, what topics have been covered, and so on, is on a flyer on the resource rack. So if that's of interest and help to you, then I encourage you to check it out. Let's pray as we come before God's word. Father, we do this every Sunday. We open your word and we hear you speak. And because we do it every Sunday, we don't want to think lightly of it, but be grateful for the discipline and the blessing it is to have you speak into our lives in the power of your spirit. And so we ask now that as, you, as we wrestle with your word in Isaiah, that you would help us to understand and to apply and to believe that we would more and more grow into the joy, the life, the peace that you have for us in Jesus. We pray in his beautiful name. Amen. Well, this term we've been in our series in the second half of Isaiah, a series we've called uh, A Better Story, because we remember that it's God is speaking to his people coming out of exile, and he's speaking to us today, and he's calling us to lean into, to trust the better story he has for our lives. And today we finish our uh, series in Isaiah, and uh, before us, potentially, is Isaiah 66 to, 62 to 66, um, which is a lot of chapters, and there's a lot in there. So I was wrestling uh, this week of where, where should we focus our time? What should we focus our attention on today? And, and in one sense, we could focus in on Isaiah 65, the new heavens and the new earth. It's such a beautiful image of the, the blessing, the future grace that God has for us. 
Um, but as I was wrestling with that, I remembered a story that uh, Pastor Matt Chandler, who's the uh, pastor of the church, village church in Texas, a story he told about his daughter. Um, and he was talking about how his daughter loves the Disney version of the Beauty and the Beast. Who's seen this movie? Not many. A few. A few. Anyone own a coffee still? Wow. A few. That's great. Um, and he was saying that uh, she loves this movie, but not all of it. She just likes the nice, pretty parts. So she loves the bit where Belle, um, who uh, walks, walks through the village uh, singing a song and the birds kind of sing with her. She loves that part. She loves how um, the cups and saucers in the beast's uh, palace uh, dance and sing. Uh, she loves that moment when Belle puts on that golden dress and comes down the staircase and dances with the beast, um, except she doesn't call him the beast. She calls him the big dog. Um, and, and she loves those parts, the nice, pretty parts. She doesn't like the kind of dark and scary parts. And so when they watch the movie, they have to kind of fast forward through it just to get to the pretty nice parts. Uh, and so essentially for Matt Chandler's daughter, the Beauty and the Beast is a story about a beautiful girl who wears nice dresses and dances with a big dog. That's the story for her. And it's not the full story, is it? She doesn't know the full story. And, and as I was thinking about that, you, we are absolutely at risk of doing that as well. And as we think about life, and God, and the Bible. It's so easy for us to just focus on the nice, pretty parts for us, the, the warm parts, that God loves us, that God is for us, that God is with us. God's got a plan and a purpose for our lives. God wants to bless us. And all those things are true, but like Belle dancing with the big dog in The Beauty and the Beast, it's not the full story. Because if we just focus in on the nice, pretty parts, then we don't have anything to say about justice in this world. We miss out on grasping the depth of God's love for us. And we don't know how to talk about what it looks like to wait patiently upon the Lord in the valleys of life. And so today we're going to park ourselves in Isaiah 64 that we read before. And we're going to look at two things that won't necessarily increase our social media profile, even though you are watching at home with us right now. Two things that won't fill this auditorium. Two things that probably won't grow Norwest quickly, but they will grow us deeply. So here they are, two things. The goodness of an angry and loving God, and secondly, learning to wait upon the Lord. Two things that probably won't grow as quickly, but they will grow us deeply. So let's go. First one, the goodness of an angry and loving God. I've put and loving in brackets there because we don't have in the West really have much trouble believing that God is loving. We, we, the, the goodness of, God, of a loving God is easy for us to process. But to say, to talk about the goodness of an angry God, that's unsettling. That's maybe irritating or even offensive to us. So look at verse 1 to 3 of Isaiah 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. You see, the cry there is, God, in the past you've acted in these ways. And if you were to do that again, if you were to break into our world with your power, we know that your enemies would be crushed and humbled. It's even stronger when you come over to Isaiah 66. Turn over there with me. Isaiah 66, verse 12. Just flick over in your Bibles. Isaiah 66, verse 12. For this is what the Lord says. I will extend peace to her like a river and the wealth of nations like a flooding stream. And you will nurse and be carried on her arm and dandled on her knees. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you and you'll be comforted over Jerusalem. When you see this, your heart will rejoice and you'll flourish like the grass. The hand of the Lord we made known to his servants. So that's the new heavens, new earth bit that we love. But... His fury will be shown to his foes. See, the Lord is coming with fire and his chariots are like a whirlwind. He will bring down his anger with fury and rebuke, his rebuke with flames of fire. For with fire and with his sword, the Lord will execute judgment on all people and many will be those slain by the Lord. 
That's unsettling. That's troubling, isn't it? And as we process that, what tends to happen for us is a whole bunch of questions jump up into our minds. And as I did that, four questions occurred to me. You may have different ones, and you can ask those in questions and comments later. But here's the four questions I thought of. Uh, first question, isn't this just poetic imagery? Like we've been saying all term that this second half of Isaiah is poetry, full of imagery. And so this judgment language, we don't need to take it too seriously. We don't need to get hung up on it because it's just poetry. It's just imagery. And, and, and if you thought that, you'd, you'd be right. Sort of. Because when it says, talks about God coming on a chariot with a sword and with fire, it's not a documentary. It's not a live feed. God is using picture language. But before we switch off and dismiss that, we need to realize that imagery doesn't mean it's not true. It's not made up. The imagery points to something that is true, points to a truth. And God uses graphic, confronting language like this to grab our attention, to help us see that his judgment will be full on and intense. So it's not just poetry. Second question, isn't this a bit primitive? Like, doesn't an angry God belong to the ancient world when injustice and cruelty were a thing? And, but we know better now today. Um, what we need is a peaceful world. We, we need an accepting God who brings peace, not violence. I, isn't that better? Now, the first thing I'd say to that is, what kind of world do we think we're living in? We've just prayed about Christians being persecuted around the world. Injustice and cruelty are just as much a reality in our world as they were in Isaiah's day. And it's this point that the uh, Croatian writer Miroslav Wolf cuts through our kind of Western complacent slumber. Uh, he grew up in the former Yugoslavia uh, and lived through the brutal Balkan walls of the early 1990s. And, and as he writes, he's trying to deal with the question of when a community has seen their village burnt to the ground, when they've seen wives and daughters raped, they've seen husbands and fathers killed, when they've seen mass graves filled with innocent victims, how do you stop the spiral down into violence and revenge and genocide upon genocide upon genocide? And he writes this. The practice of nonviolence requires a belief in divine justice. I'll say that again because you should see more eyebrows going up. <laughs> The practice of nonviolence requires a belief in divine justice. You see what he's saying? So it's easy for us in, in the West, where we really don't experience any injustice, to have this kind of very complacent, sentimental view that it'll all be fine. But when you've experienced injustice, when you've seen injustice, it's much harder. And the temptation is to spiral into violence. And Wolf is saying that if, if the God isn't angry at sin and injustice, if God isn't going to bring perfect justice, then what happens is you either spiral into revenge or you give up in despair and you have no hope. The only way that peace and nonviolence makes sense is if God is going to bring perfect justice. So you don't need to take revenge. This is the goodness of an angry God. His justice brings peace, encourages peace, not violence. Third question, doesn't this produce arrogance? Because we sit here as God's people and we say, well, we're on the right team. It's those other people that are going to get, going to cop it, going to be punished. And doesn't that lead to an arrogance? But look again at Isaiah 64 again with me, because something really profound happens in the chapter. I don't know if you noticed it as we read before. The first five verses are that cry for God to intervene, to break in and bring justice. And then you get halfway through verse 5. But when we continue to sin against them, your, that's God's ways, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Now that's not normal human behavior to write that, to say that, to feel that, to own that. Because what normal human behavior says is, well, I'm one of the good people, and it's those other people, the bad people, that need to be punished. But here, there's amazing humility. Even our good deeds are filthy rags because our hearts are corrupt, full of pride and selfishness and greed. And so then, second half of verse 6, or, sorry, verse 6, 
Uh, We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. The very thing that they kind of longed for God to do in the first half of the chapter is happening to us, that we shrivel up, we're swept away by our sins. It's the recognition, the realization that we're just as guilty as anyone else. We're just as deserving of judgment as anyone else. Do You see, knowing the God of the Bible doesn't produce arrogance, but humility. Because you know that you're just as guilty as everyone else. So then the fourth question. Why can't I leave aside God's anger and just focus on his love? Now, in our context, in the kind of affirming climate, that feels great, doesn't it? It feels more positive, very affirming. But the problem is, if we just say God is loving and we don't have any grasp of his anger, his righteous anger at sin, then we rob ourselves of the depth of his love for us. We end up with a love that's watery and diluted. And God ends up like this kind of forgetful grandfather who doesn't really remember the names of his grandkids but thinks it's probably good to have some kids around, right? It's a kind of careless, sentimental, indulgent love with no real substance to it. But when we own verse 5, but when we continue to sin against your ways, you are angry. How then can we be saved? When we own that, how on earth can I be saved? And then you remember that God made a way. As you saw the suffering servant dies for our sins, deals with our sins, then you start to see the depth of God's love for you. The more that you grasp God's righteous anger at sin, the more you see the lengths that he went to save you, what it cost him to rescue you. And now you begin to grasp just how much God loves you. This is the goodness of an angry and loving God. He gives us peace in the cruelty of life. He keeps us humble, not arrogant. And we begin to grasp the depth of his love for us. See, I told you it's not a truth that's going to grow as quickly. But it will grow as deeply. And then the second truth that will grow as deeply is learning to wait upon the Lord. Now, you can see just in that phrase, that's something that's going to grow as deeply, not quickly, right? Because waiting upon the Lord is not quick. It's not easy. It requires trust. And patience. If you read in the first half of Isaiah that the people of Judah struggled with this. When they saw the Assyrian Empire rising up on their border and they were terrified, they didn't look to the Lord, they didn't ask the Lord for help, but they tried to secure their future by making an alliance with Egypt. Egypt will protect us. This is one of the reasons God rebukes his people against trusting in chariots, the chariots of Egypt. And we struggle with this too, this patience. We are we're not patient people, are we? We want quick solutions. Three steps, four action points. That's quick and easy. I need an answer yesterday. I want a solution last week, right? So ask yourself this. When you're in trouble, when you face a big decision in your life, what's your instinct? To act? To take charge? To fix it yourself? Or do you stop and pray? And ask God for his guidance and help. I think one of the reasons that we miss out on so much blessing and guidance from God in our lives is that we kind of rule it out from the start. Because we're already rushing off to fix it, to follow our own solution, take action. Verse 4. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. Who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. So what does it look like to wait upon the Lord? Sometimes it won't look like much to the outside. It will look very passive. Like if you're in a crisis or you're facing a really difficult decision and you don't know what to do and you feel powerless about anything, you really are just kind of handing it over and waiting because you think, I I don't know... What to do? I have no power in this. I, I, I can't move forward until God acts, until God guides me, God helps. It looks very passive, just waiting. And then there are times when waiting upon the Lord will look a lot more active. Waiting as you're doing. Now, I know that sounds contradictory to be waiting and doing or waiting and acting. So let me give you an example. Preaching. When I'm preparing during the week to preach... 
I'm praying, Lord, will you help me to understand your word that I can teach it faithfully so that people hear what you want them to hear? And I'm praying for you guys that God would help you to understand and to believe and to trust his good news. And then on a Sunday, as I'm driving up here in the car, I'm praying, Lord, will you fill me with your spirit so that the words that come out of my mouth are the words you want people to hear, that they're the words that you want to bless people with. And I'm praying for you guys that God would pour out his spirit upon us so that we would believe his word, believe his good news and be changed by it. And then when the Bible reading's happening, I'm standing up the back near the resource rack praying, Lord, you promise that your word will not return to you without achieving the purpose that you intended for it. So will you do it again this morning? Will you work in your people so that they are changed by your word? And then as I'm preaching, I'm waiting upon the Lord. Because I can look out, and sometimes it's really obvious how you guys are engaging. Some very active listening going on, nodding heads, writing notes, and so on, which is really encouraging for a preacher. Sometimes people fall asleep, that's true, it does happen. But actually, all that's just kind of surface level. Because I really don't know what's going on in your heart. I can't see that. And so I'm waiting for God to do his work upon you, for him to bring his word so that you hear what you need to hear. Some of you need to be deeply encouraged. Some of you need to be challenged. We all need to be transformed. Did you see that's an example of waiting and doing? As I'm preparing, as I'm driving here, as I'm, the Bible reading is going on, as I'm preaching, I'm, I'm waiting upon the Lord all at the same time. That's what it often looks like to wait upon the Lord. It's not let go and let God and just sit and do nothing, but it's we keep going and we're praying the whole time. And we can do that because we have a God we can trust and rely upon. I think each of us should have um, Psalm 20 verse 7 as the banner over our lives. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some people in our world will trust in their health, in their education, in their careers, in their money, in their charisma. But we trust in the Lord. Amen? Amen. And we can do that because God is the God of Isaiah 64, verse 4. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God beside you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. There's no one like our God. I want to show you uh, the comparison between God and other gods. Come over to Isaiah 46 with me. Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46, verse 1. Bel bows down, Nebo stoops low. Their idols are borne by beasts of burden. The images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. They stoop down and bow down together, unable to rescue the burden. They themselves go off into captivity. So Bel and Nebo are the gods of the Babylonians, and you see that they have to be carried around, and they are a burden to the people who follow them. Look at God, verse 3. Listen to me, you descendants of Jacob, all the remnant of the people of Israel, you whom I have upheld since your birth and have carried since you were born. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you, I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. Do you see that? Upheld, carried, sustain, carry, sustain, rescue. There is no one like our God who carries and sustains his people. That's what Isaiah 64 verse 4 is building off. There is no one like our God. And do you remember that moment in Jesus' ministry when James and John came to Jesus and they said, hey, we want to sit on your right and left in glory and in your kingdom. It's an outrageous request. We pick it up at Mark 10, verse 41. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. And the reason for this, for even the Son of Man, Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
See, the way of the world, Jesus says, is to push and assert and to take control and to become great by being over people. Jesus says, I didn't come to lord my power over people, but to serve. And Jesus served in the most costly, hardest way by dying for our sins on the cross, being a ransom for men. That is Isaiah 64, verse 4, written in blood. There is no one like our God who works for his people, who serves his people. See, if what you really needed in life was provided by you, like if you could give yourself everything that you need, then this church, preaching, praying, singing, would look very different, wouldn't it? We'd praise you. and We'd celebrate you. The heavens declare your glory. The skies proclaim the work of your hands. Sounds terrible, doesn't it? But we don't do that because all we have and all we are is a gift from God, and so we celebrate God. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. That is a truth that won't grow as quickly, but it will grow as deeply. The book of Isaiah has in part been a story of a people who refuse to trust the Lord, who refuse to wait upon the Lord. And it's a story of a God who breaks in with power to deal with our sins and to pursue us in love. And so all through this second half of Isaiah in this term, we've been wrestling with whether we will trust, whether we will lean into, whether we will rely upon the better story that God has for us. That's my prayer. I hope it's your prayer. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus, who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for us, for many. And we thank you that he's still working. He didn't leave us to just work it out ourselves, but he is alive today and he is working today. And that he promised that he would be with us to the very end of the age. And so as people who know the gracious rule of Jesus and how he serves and works and leads and guides us, will you so work in us that we rely upon him for all things, that we trust not in our wealth or our health or our strength or our careers, but we trust in the Lord Jesus. We pray this in his mighty name. Amen.